Next on Book TV, investigative reporter Annie Jacobson presents a history of the military base Area 51, located in the Nevada desert. The author uses recently declassified documents, on-site reporting, and interviews with numerous people who worked and lived at the base. It's about an hour. Good morning, everyone, <clears throat> and I wanted to thank the Commonwealth Club for having me and everyone for being here. It's a real author's dream to have a, a full house for a, a book speaking event. And thank you, Gil, for having me on your show and also for moderating tonight. And we'll get to some questions because I, I know people love to ask questions. I certainly do. And I wouldn't be here if I didn't have that sense of curiosity. So um, what I'm going to start with, I'm going to actually read you two paragraphs from my book. But I'm going to set the the stage, so to speak, a little bit first and let you know where Area 51 is other than in people's imaginations because it really does exist. And it's located in southern Nevada, about 75 miles north of Las Vegas. It's in a much bigger parcel of land that is the largest federally restricted piece of real estate in the United States. It's about the size of Connecticut and it's called the Nevada Test and Training Range. Inside of the Nevada Test and Training Range, there's a 1,350 square mile parcel called the Nevada Test Site. And the Nevada Test Site is divided up into quadrants. The quadrant numbers have changed and shifted and gone underground over the years, but in essence, they are 1 through 30, with some mysteriously missing. Um, Area 51 sits just outside of the Nevada test site, but inside the greater land parcel that is the Nevada test and training range. And it is there that many, it is there that my book, the basis of my book centers, and that is where many of the most secret and perhaps most alarming uh, national security projects took place, but also many of the most fantastic ones that kept us all safe, uh, arguably kept us out of World War III with the Russians, um, certainly helped our pilots in Vietnam. Some really great things go went on there and probably continue to go on there today. But um, with that said, I'm going to read you two paragraphs in my book about uh, that really speak to what the book is. And, and when I was researching the book, I was able to interview a total of 74 men who had uh, rare, unprecedented access to Area 51, 32 of whom lived and worked at the base for extended periods of time. And about 20 of them, I kind of tell their stories, their characters in my book. And one of them that I'm going to be reading about is a pilot, a CIA pilot named Ken Collins. And Ken Collins in this scene is flying the A-12 ox cart, which is the, was the CIA's original Mach 3 spy plane that flew at 90,000 feet. So Mach 3 is three times the speed of sound, and 90,000 feet is about 17 miles up. And this was in the 1960s, so it was radical science and technology at the time. And the spy plane was built to take over after the U-2 spy plane program was outed when Gary Powers was shot down over the Soviet Union. So I write, Collins pushed the aircraft through Mach 2.8. In another 45 seconds, he would be out of the danger zone. Nearing 85,000 feet, the inevitable tiny black dots appear, began to appear on the aircraft windshield, sporadic at first, like the first drops of summer rain. Only a few months earlier, scientists at Area 51 had been baffled by those black dots. They worried it was some kind of high atmosphere corrosion until the mystery was solved in the lab. It turned out the black spots were dead bugs that were cycling around in the upper atmosphere, blasted into the jet stream by the world's two superpowers rally of thermonuclear bombs. The bugs were killed in the bomb's blast and sent aloft to 90,000 feet in the ensuing mushroom clouds as they gained orbit. When I first came across that detail, I found it incredible. I thought to myself, 
what on earth, or that high up, uh, are bugs doing, dead bugs circling around? And I didn't really understand being 43 years old, um, not having lived through the Cold War to the extent that many of my sources did. I, I wondered, well, I was 40 when I started the book, but um, I wondered, it didn't make much sense to me how, why these bugs were there. And in essence, it's a bit of an analogy about what Area 51 is. Um, it was set up to conduct espionage on the Soviet Union. The CIA began building its base there in 1955 with the U-2 spy plane because the CIA wanted to spy on Russia and see what they were doing. And one of the other men that I interviewed in my book was Hervey Stockman, and he just passed two months ago, which is also a really interesting side note that the men that I interviewed are really in the last chapter of their lives. Um, but Hervey Stockman explained to me what it was like to be the first man to fly over the Soviet Union in a U-2. And yes, he agitated Nikita Khrushchev greatly. And yes, there was a lot of fallout between the Eisenhower administration and the Soviets over this spying that was going on. But at the same time, what Hervey Stockman brought back in the film canisters of his U-2 was over 400,000 square feet of film, of spy footage, about what was going on in the Soviet Union. And as Hervey said to me, that w the CIA was able to learn and understand that, in fact, the Soviets were not lining up for World War III, as many members of the Air Force wanted to believe, certainly General LeMay, who's a character in my book as well, you might call him an antagonist. Um, <clears throat> and so when you consider that the CIA's job is to present intelligence to the president based on fact, not fiction, or not speculation, um, that is what the U-2 spy plane certainly did for us. And I think that was an important, uh, important notion. But at the same time, there were other elements of the government that were really pushing science, as I write in the book. And I think here's where I get into some of the more dangerous areas and some of the questions that I, that I l would like readers to be able to ask of themselves um, about whether or not pushing science is necessarily a good thing. Um, right around that same time, or actually if you back up a bit, you know, for a while after World War II we had an atomic bomb, and then when we found out the Russians were, had al also had an atomic bomb, this was in 1949, um, <clears throat> there was a big movement toward creating a bigger bomb called the thermonuclear bomb, which is how these bugs got so high up. And Robert Oppenheimer, the father of the atomic bomb at the time, really opposed that on moral grounds. He said it was not a good idea to create a weapon that was larger than its target. In other words, the thermonuclear bomb is so big that it would not wipe out a military installation, it would wipe out a whole city. The thermonuclear bomb that sent the bugs aloft that Ken Collins flew through was actually a thermonuclear bomb that was 10 megatons. And that thermonuclear bomb is big enough if it's dropped on Manhattan, it would wipe out all five boroughs and it would kill 75% of the population down to Washington, D.C. over time. So obviously that's a bomb that's bigger than its target. And in my book, I think an, the, one of the more interesting analogies that I came across was that at Area 51, here we were trying to prevent war, so to speak. That's what the CIA was doing with their espionage platforms. And on the other side of the fence, over at the atomic bombing range at the Nevada test site, the Atomic Energy Commission and the Department of Defense were practicing how to have a nuclear war. Um, this spy plane that Ken Collins was flying was called the A-12 Oxcart, and although most people have probably never heard of it because it was only declassified by the CIA in 2007, 50 years after its drawings, and one of the characters in my book is the physicist who did those original drawings and helped build 
stealth for the CIA. Um, but this idea that you could have these two uh, notions working at once is a little bit complicated, preventing a war but practicing to have one. But what I, the point I was making about the ox cart was that y you probably have never seen it or, or heard of it maybe, but its cousin is very famous and that is the, I don't know if this is a military crowd, but it's the uh, uh, SR-71, the Air Force's famous Blackbird. Um, that went Mach 3 and the SR-71 is interesting because it actually stood for originally reconnaissance strike but President Johnson when he announced it bungled it and they didn't want to correct the president so they corrected the plane but um, reconnaissance strike meaning so that when the Air Force decided to take over the CIA's espionage program their idea was to have it be um, a spy plane that could go in and photograph a post-nuclear site to, to figure out what to follow up the bombing with. Um, and I think that's one of the more interesting parts or perhaps more evocative parts of my book that I hope people will read and think about, which is how these different federal organizations that we have work together fight with one another on these secret programs that um, on balance perhaps keep us safer and more, more nationally secure but sometimes enter into the area of uh, recklessness and I write about that in, in the book also some of the weapons tests that we did out there um, were in my opinion reckless one of which W there was a program that we had called Project 57 and I tell the story through the eyes of the security guard who worked on that program. He was also the first security guard at Area 51 during the U2 program. His name was Richard Mingus but to work overtime so he could buy a new car he agreed to moonlight on this Project 57 which was the idea that the Defense Department had well what would happen in America if this was in 1957, by the way. What would happen if one of our planes carrying a nuclear weapon were to crash on American soil? Would it have an actual explosion? Would it create a kind of dirty bomb environment? They, they didn't know and they wanted to find out. So at the very edges of Area 51 in a land parcel called Area 13, they decided to do what they called a safety test and um, in essence they they set off a dirty bomb out there and they contaminated 895 acres with plutonium that is still contaminated out there. Um, so the idea of what is keeping us safe, what is pushing science, what is reckless, what is important, um, all kinds kind of comes together in what I think is the enigma of Area 51. Um, I could go on for a very long time. I wrote a 500 page book and it's filled with stories but maybe to keep me on track I'll uh, take some questions from the audience and uh, we can start a dialogue. We've got questions yeah. that are, oh, that are coming questions. up, yeah, Annie. Okay, yeah, no, that's okay. okay. Um, this is actually interesting because it goes to a heart of your book, a lot of which is about secrecy and how off budget this operation was. The person asked what percentage of the CIA budget was Area 51 and how was Area 51 justified? But you write in your book that though the CIA is certainly um, running Area 51, a large part of this and a large part of the most controversial things in your book comes from the Atomic Energy Commission. That's right and the Atomic Energy Commission is now known as the Department of Energy. They've changed their name four times over the years I think to kind of if you change the name of something enough times maybe people will forget about it. Um, but the original part of your question I, I wanted to speak on that because it's very interesting there's a one of the people in my book that I write about at length although he's passed so everything that I've written about him is from archives but he was the sort of uh, the first man to run Area 51 for the CIA and his name was Richard Bissell and he's famous in CIA legend and lore for a number of things but he ultimately had to step down for taking all the blame for the Bay of Pigs. And in my book I, I explain a little bit that I think he got the bad rap on the Bay of Pigs but so it goes when you work in that kind of a business. But uh, asking about where the budgets came from, 
I found out in my research, Richard Bissell was, you know, he was a brilliant economist. He was a Yale graduate, and he became the executor of finance for the Marshall Plan after World War II. So there was something like $13 billion that was um, at the disposal of Richard Bissell to help rebuild uh, Europe. And a friend came knocking at his door one night um, in Washington, D.C., a man by the name of Frank Wisner. And uh, the two sat in front of Bissell's fireplace, and Wisner said, you know, we need some money for this group we have over at the CIA. And because they had a mutual friend in Averill Harriman, Bissell knew better than to ask many more questions and just kind of agreed that that would be all right. And that those funds were diverted over from the Marshall Plan to the CIA. About two and a half years later, Bissell became the uh, subordinate to Alan Dulles, the director at the time of the CIA, and Area 51 was up and running. Okay. Several people want you to cut to the little men. Uh, I told Annie before we started that the last time I saw the Reverend Ralph De Abernathy, he complained to me that he wrote, and it is, if you ever get a chance to read it, a brilliant book in the history of the civil rights movement, and all anyone wanted to ask him about was one sentence about Martin Luther King's personal life. So there's seven pages in this book, and, and here come a bunch of questions. Okay. Uh, who, what were the little men that were seen at Roswell per the first chapter? Can you comment on the UFO connection to Area 51? What about the UFOs and aliens? What about UFOs? <laughs> Go for it, Annie. <laughs> <laughs> Curious crowd. No one wants to hear about war and weapons um, <laughs> when there's little green men to talk about. Um, Okay, but first I want to say something about my sources, because this is important to me, and it's important to me as a journalist. Um, I interviewed a lot of men for this book, as Gil said, you know, really the, the, the largest number of men that have ever gone on record about Area 51, and they all go on record using their names. And there's one exception, and that is the source that I write about in the last seven pages of my book that many people want to know about. Um, and this source remains anonymous for reasons of safety and security and also because that program, the program that he discussed with me, has not been declassified per se. Um, and it's an interesting distinction as a journalist to make between being able to source your sources information up against declassified documents um, as I did with the first 367 pages of my book. Uh, National Archives, Library of Congress, declassified documents with CIA, with the Atomic Energy Commission, Department of Defense, Department of Intelligence Agency, NRO, NSA, I can go on and on and on. A lot of late nights looking at documents. Um, and then there is a point in the book where I make a shift in the way I wrote the book. Um, everything in the beginning is written in a traditional journalist form where you annotate everything and you make clear where your sources came from. And in the very end of the book, I lean into the reader, who I trust, has read my whole book, um, and I say, okay, but that's not why Area 51 is still classified. And Area 51 has never been admitted to by any organization in the government, and that's a fact. They, any of the declassified documents always have the word Area 51 blacked out or redacted. Sometimes they refer to it as the test facility or the site, but it's only ever located in print twice by me, and I believe those were obviously errors. Um, so why keep this base secret? And I lean into my reader and I say, here's why I think the base is secret. And this came to me from a source. And <clears throat> in the last seven pages, I tell you what that source said to me. And I'm very clear to make clear that there is no documents to fact check this up against. While I did get some very what I consider to be corroborating suggestive evidence in archives, um, the actual story is from one man's oral history. 
Um, the source was an engineer for EG&G, which means that he had a top secret clearance and also a Q clearance for handling nuclear secrets. And I examined the source's uh, medical records, his war records. I looked at the documents that he was, the certificates and awards that he was given by the Atomic Energy Commission. He worked for the commission across three decades as a contractor. He was a member of the Manhattan Project. Um, and the source told me that in 1951, he was one of five engineers that was asked to solve what is called a wicked engineering problem. And a wicked engineering problem means that it's something that no one has figured out and needs to be solved. But solving that problem will create its own new set of problems. And the source told me that he was one of the five people who received the equipment from Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, and that was originally what crashed in Roswell, and that it was a flying circular-shaped aircraft. It was not from Mars, it was from Russia. And it was actually a, uh, originally a Third Reich design. Much of what I write about in the book discusses how uh, a program called Operation Paperclip was put into effect after the war where America pillaged Third Reich scientists to head up our aerospace programs and m much of our military programs. Warner Von Braun is the best example. He designed the V-2 rocket for Hitler. He came over and designed the Apollo uh, rockets for Kennedy. Um, but Russia also did the same thing. They pillaged the scientists that they could get their hands on. And so this flying disc, according to the engineer from EG&G, was something that had crashed in New Mexico, and the intent was for it to be a hoax, that Stalin, and again, we're in 1947 here when we're talking about the Roswell crash, uh, 1947, Stalin did not yet have an atomic weapon, Truman did, they were bitter rivals, and so Stalin made a move, fired a warning shot over Truman's bow, so to speak, to say, you may have the atomic bomb, but I have psychological warfare. And a la the War of the Worlds, he wanted to send this flying disc to land in New Mexico and have people come out that looked like aliens. And the EG&G engineer told me that the child-sized pilots inside were the result of ghastly human experiments in the Soviet Union. And that is what he told me. And I repeat it in my book because I wrote the uncensored history of Area 51, not the censored history. And many people take umbrage with that. Certainly a couple of the guys in my book aren't happy about it, and I understand why. Um, as they said to me, you know, we were John Wayne out there saving the free world, and no one likes to hear about this kind of, possibly this kind of um, ghastly goings on in the desert. But this is what my source told me. I absolutely stand by his veracity, and it's what I wrote in the book, and it's obviously what a lot of people um, are very skeptical of and at the same time want to know more about. If the, let me ask one, one follow-up before we get to the next one. So the reason then, if it was not aliens, it would panic the population for keeping this such a deep, dark secret would have been what? The reason for keeping the program for, a secret? For keeping this particular program, essentially reverse engineering this disk, the idea yes. that Russians were doing this psych ops if they were caught red-handed. Uh, why keep it a secret? Wouldn't that be a victory? Look how awful Stalin is. Mm. Look at what they've done. Uh, there was evidence that he took some of the papers that were captured from Joseph Mengele, and I, this would have been a great propaganda victory for the United States. Absolutely, and that was a question that I asked my source repeatedly. Um, I interviewed him for over a hundred hours across, what I write in the book was 18 months, now it's been more than two years. Um, we would discuss nuclear weapons, we would discuss lots of things which I would then go fact check. And at the end of our several hour interview I would say, can I ask you another question about the subject that we're not allowed to talk about? And he would 
say yes. And that was one question I asked often. And um, now remember, keep in mind that this individual also participated in the program. So he was, according to him, a first-hand witness, reverse engineered this craft, received the people um, that were the child size aviators. So I asked him that question and he finally gave me an answer, which I write in the book, and he said, because we were doing the same thing. Um, the idea that the American scientists wanted to also push science, that they didn't want the Soviets ahead of us in any program, whatever it may be. And I, I do want to say a note on that because another journalist said to me, you know, how dare you accuse the United States government of such horrible things. And my answer to it was, and I spend quite a bit of time writing about this in my book, um, while I don't claim to be able to speak for the technology in the flying craft or certainly the, te the, the kind of medical experiments that would create that kind of a, of an alien looking person. Um, what I do speak to and what I do write about and what I do fact check and source is what the Atomic Energy Commission did during its tenure and the reckless human experimentation that they did. There's, you know, President Clinton put together a commission in the 1990s after a reporter named Eileen Wellsom revealed that the Atomic Energy Commission had been experimenting, injecting retarded children with plutonium at a state school in Massachusetts. And, you know, I see all the faces, everyone's like, oh, God, how horrible. And people really don't want to hear about that. And they, they turn the other way and they say, that's just horrible and kind of go on. And, you know, I felt as a journalist that by, I believe what my source told me, and I believe that what he told me, the reason that he told me what he told me was because it was a matter of conscience. The other four engineers are dead, and so it's just him. He was very clear about that. And so if a debate or a discussion ensues um, as to whether or not this kind of a program could go on, um, how long it went on for. I feel that's an important discussion and it's why I chose to write about it in my book. You're listening to the Commonwealth Club of California radio program. Our guest today is Annie Jacobson, Los Angeles Magazine columnist, author of a new book detailing her investigation of a legendary military base known as Area 51. This question from the audience, if the contents and activities of Area 51 are much less shocking than the speculation all these years, why do you think the government maintains so much secrecy about it? And I think we touched upon that as well. But I will also say that, um, you know, I take the reader all the way up through the 80s. One of the last programs that I write about uh, was the F-117 bomber, the, that sort of diamond-shaped stealth bomber that became famous in Gulf War I that was developed out at Area 51 after the Air Force took over and sort of replaced a lot of the camera bays with weapons bays. Um, but what has been going on since the war on terror began is, a, is certainly out of my need to know. And, um, and none of that, I didn't have any sources tell me what was really going on there now um, because that really is obviously of national security concern because we're fighting the war on terror. But it is certainly a place where the drones are test flo flown. And I also write another interesting story from right about 1998 when drones, everyone's familiar with them now because they're used in Pakistan, but they began as espionage platforms that only carried cameras. Um, they were actually used in the Serbian-Bosnian conflict and they were just kind of not interesting to many people other than the CIA. But right around the late 90s, this unknown terrorist named Osama bin Laden appeared on the scene and the CIA wanted to, they were considering assassinating him with a, with a drone and the way they would do it was they would attach missiles to the drone. And this was kind of a radical idea so they got together the CIA and the Air Force and they decided to engineer these Hellfire missiles. The missiles are so accurate the Hellfire comes from fire and forget. You just push a button and it goes. But first they had to test it out there and the president's concern at the time was well this Osama bin Laden character is known to do a lot of falcon hunting with members of various Middle Eastern royal families and what if some somebody important is at his compound when we attack him with these 
with this predator drone carrying a Hellfire missile that we don't know much about and we haven't used yet. So they, set, they built a mock-up of bin Laden's Afghanistan farm, which was called Tarnak Farms, and that's where they practiced um, how to possibly assassinate him without collateral damage. Uh, this was before 9-11, but at the end of the... At the end of the experiment, the State Department got involved and there was lots of legalities about assassinating someone, so they decided not to do it. So, question, how could Area 51 secrets be kept from American presidents? That's a very tricky and uncomfortable question, certainly for this journalist. Um, but in the very beginning of the book, I explained to you that something that I found really pretty shocking when I learned it um, in researching this book, that the Atomic Energy Commission actually has a system of secret keeping that runs parallel to the president's system of secret keeping, which is the national security system. Um, that is not the way the Constitution was written, but it is what the Atomic Energy Act of 1946 allowed. So when the charter was written, right after World War II for the Atomic Energy Commission, they created the system of secret keeping, which the slang for it is called born classified. Um, scholars who have looked into this secret keeping system say that it's, it allows the AEC to have unanswerable authority. And that is certainly the case, and that is why the Atomic Energy Commission was able to do so many things. The bomb test I told you about that sent the bugs up to 90,000 feet, um, that thermonuclear bomb test, it involved 12,000 people in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. No one knew it was going on when it went on. Um, so secret keeping is an important part of Area 51 for some reasons, but it's also not a good situation for other reasons and it is the source who tells me the story in the end who told me that um, I asked him you know I, the, President Clinton looked into the crimes of the Atomic Energy Commission uh, how come he didn't find out about this rogue program at Area 51 that involved Roswell and what he said to me was he almost found out about it but he didn't have a need to know A question that goes back to uh, the UFO story. Why would Stalin send the craft to Roswell, New Mexico, instead of a more populated area? That's not an answer I have. Um, I'll ask the source. I was kidding. Um, no, I, I don't. I, you know, the thing that I write in the end of the book is I'm very clear about saying he said this, and according to the engineer, um, there are some places in the epilogue where I speculate about some things, and I, I go to some of my other sources and ask them. I ask the physicist, okay, you know, could we really have had a, a stealthy flying disc? The physicist, Ed Lovick, who invented stealth for the CIA, had an interesting answer, which was that he recalled sometime in the 1950s, Kelly Johnson, who was the head of Skunk Works, who invented the... Um, who built those planes for the CIA. Kelly Johnson had Ed Lovick radar test some round-shaped aircraft, and at the end of the day, they decided that it just wasn't, it just wasn't, you know, appropriate for a pilot to fly. It was a dangerous thing for a pilot to fly. So, I, you know, I have as many questions as I have answers. Actually, I have more questions than I have answers, but I don't have the answer to that one. Although you write in the book, the Roswell base, uh, air base was actually an important base and of course White Sands, Los Alamos, I mean that was not an unimportant area in terms of national security. Oh it was the most important area in the United States. You had Los Alamos, you had Sandia, Los Alamos was where the nuclear scientists were working, Sandia was where the weapons were being assembled and Roswell uh, was the, five the base of the 509th which was the bomber group. Um, you know, one of the guys I interview in the book is this amazing legend, uh, Colonel Richard Leghorn. He's 92 now, and he's actually at home writing a, according to his secretary, he's at home writing a paper on my book. Um, and uh, he just did an interview with the Cape Cod Times talking all about his role in my book. And um, he is accredited in general with inventing o the concept of overhead. Uh, our first post-nuclear 
a post-war nuclear test was a, in 1946 and was in the Pacific. It was called Operation Crossroads. And Colonel Leghorn was in charge of photographing those bombs from the air. And in my interview with him, it was amazing because he explained to me all about how the base from which they left with all the camera equipment was the Roswell Army Air Base because at the time that was the only um, military base in the country that had bombers that could actually carry nuclear weapons. So that area of New Mexico couldn't have been more important to national security in 1947. If somebody wants to know if it's possible, and you answer this in the book, that many UFOs were actually were and are they right U.S. military aircraft that the United States has been lying about? Absolutely. I mean, one of the things that I absolutely was able to source was the CIA's obsession with UFOs starting in the 1950s. They actually even created their own UFO de uh, department, and this is all based on declassified documents. It's funny to read them, read through them, because the, C the guys at the CIA in the 1950s were really still gentlemen spies. They kind of fancied themselves, um, you know, on the ground spies, and this idea of science and technology was a little bit plebeian to them. So you see in all of these memos where they have to deal with UFOs, they're saying, you know, why can't the Air Force handle this? But in fact, out at Area 51, the U-2 spy plane accounted for over 50% of all UFO sightings on the West Coast. It flew at 70,000 feet, which is about 13 miles up. And when it was flying up in the sky, it looked like a giant silver cross. And you can imagine people on the ground seeing something up that high would wonder. And then, of course, the same thing happened in the 1960s when this incredible CIA spy plane called the Oxcart was flying at Mach 3, even higher up. And there's a couple great accounts from some of the guys in my book. Colonel Slater is a real Cold War hero who I write about. He was the commander of the base for a number of years in the 60s. And he explained to me how often commercial airline pilots would be flying on the west coast, let's say at dusk, at 30,000 feet, and they would see the ox cart fly over, overhead at 90,000 feet at Mach 3, and people in the plane would see it as well, and they would, the pilots would radio in, you know, UFO, UFO, and Colonel Slater would have to send the FBI to wherever it was the plane was landing and make the pilots and the people sign inadvertent disclosure forms, letting them know they'd be in real serious trouble if they told anyone about that. And these kind of things certainly only added to the UFO lore and mythology. Yeah, plus I mean, you had five ox carts that crashed, and of course, the, as they went out to get the titanium covers and all of that, the, Obviously, these kind of secret people went out in, in the desert and people mm -hmm. saw them and it all looked like they were getting something very secret, which it was, but mm -hmm. just not flying saucer. Which brings us to somebody asking, why in your opinion has Area 51 become such a popular element in U.S. and global popular culture? Most assuredly because of the conspiracies that are attached to it. Um, We've talked about the UFOs um, and the aliens, but there's two other big conspiracy theories that are sort of embedded themselves in Area 51. They are that the lunar landing was faked and filmed at Area 51. That's a big one. Um, I interviewed a lot of conspiracy theorists for my book. I also interviewed Buzz Aldrin the second man on the moon, and I found his testimony to be a little bit more believable than the, <laughs> some of the other people, but that's just the journalist in me. Um, but there, the thread, the link there is that the, over at the Nevada test site, the neighbor to Area 51, there are these giant craters from the atomic bombs. I was lucky enough to go there with a couple of the guys who were in my book and these atomic bomb craters are these giant cavernous you know things that look very much like the surface of the moon and i interview a man named ernie williams who actually was the tour guide for the apollo astronauts 
uh, in the late 60s and early 70s, they would go out to the Nevada test site and put mock-ups on their back that they would then, would, you know, that they would wear on the moon when they finally went there. But they, the point was to kind of roam around the geology of the, lo of the lunar landscape. And I have some great photographs in the book of that. But I think that this gave way to some of the conspiracies about the lunar landing. And another one I'll, I'll touch upon was the, a lot of conspiracy theorists told me that Area 51 is filled with underground tunnels and that these tunnels connect to other military bases across the country. What I found out was there are a lot of underground tunnels, certainly at the Nevada test site under Area 12 and 11. Um, one of the tunnels is 4,500 feet deep. That's very deep. Um, and starting in the late 1950s, the Department of Defense and the Atomic Energy Commission would use these underground tunnels to explode nuclear weapons uh, to see what would happen to different pieces of military equipment, to see what could survive and whatnot. So that's where a lot of that mythology, I believe, comes from. There's something you write in the book that nobody's going to ask about it unless they've read the book, but I think is important before I take the next question, which is when we're talking about some of the scientific recklessness, something that I had never heard of before reading Area 51, was we did a, a high-altitude thermonuclear test that they knew in advance might endanger the ozone layer. They kind of just wanted to see what would happen. True? When I first heard about this, it really made me wonder whether, um, when, you know, when I was growing up in the 70s, we were told that we couldn't use aerosol deodorant anymore because it was ruining the ozone. And when I heard this, I thought, I don't think it's the deodorant. Um, <laughs> and what's, what's really interesting is I heard this story from the nuclear weapons engineer who actually wired this bomb. Um, but there were two nuclear tests codenamed Teak and Orange and they actually took place down in Johnston Island in the Pacific, um, not at Area 51, but the crew that worked regularly at Area 51 wiring nuclear bombs went down there. And the idea, uh, the president's science advisor at the time, his name was James Killian, um, he had such power and persuasion with the president that he, anything he did, he did not have to report to Congress. Later in his memoirs, he admits that maybe that wasn't a good idea. Um, but at the time, James Killian authorized this two-headed nuclear weapons test. These are megaton thermonuclear bombs. One was set off 28 miles up. The other was set off 50 miles up. But 28 miles up is right around where the ozone layer is. And at the time, there was, I found in the declassified documents, there was discussion among the scientists what might happen and could we make a hole in the ozone layer. This was an actual discussion. And the answer was, yes, we could, but we believe the bomb turbulence would then close back up that hole if it were made. And so they went ahead with the test. There's a couple of questions from the audience about sources. First one is, if everyone's interviewed is sworn to secrecy, how is anything they say valuable or believable? And then a variation on that, do you have a top secret clearance? And if not, what makes you think these people you interviewed told you the truth? Um, what's interesting is some of the things that I've been talking about, like the Project 57, the dirty bomb test that um, spread plutonium over 895 acres up there. Uh, people have said to me that, have asked me that exact question, you know, well, that's actually not classified. Those documents I located in the Atomic Energy Commission archives. Um, I even located photographs, but it didn't look to me like anyone else had looked at them. And I actually had a really difficult time trying to find them. But once I f was able to find someone who had knowledge of that and knew it had been declassified, uh, I was able to talk freely with him about that program, and he was able to give me some keywords that allowed me to look up the program and access it. Um, the program is called Project 57, but everything was classified under 57 Project, I mean, uh, organized. Um, so 
all of the programs that I talk about, except for the program in the end, have actually been declassified. It's just that a lot of them are kind of hidden, or perhaps people weren't interested in them in and of themselves. I think part of what makes my book interesting is that I try to give you the whole landscape of Area 51 and its nearest neighbors and what was going on there. Another one about, uh, about the aliens who were, according to your source, not aliens at all. Uh, were there autopsies done on the Roswell victims? Uh, according to his story, two actually lived but were in a coma. Uh, and why would their remains still remain classified? The first part of the question was, tell me again. The first part of the question was, were there autopsies oh, on them? That I don't know. Um, they arrived as, as bodies um, when they arrived, according to my source, out at Area 51. And they were comatose, but still breathing. One of them died shortly thereafter, according to my source. Um, and the reason why it, the program is still classified, according to my source, is what we touched upon earlier, that the uh, government decided to embark upon its own program. What I'm also going to say at this point, which is interesting, is that one of the most interesting and disturbing pieces of information that my source shared with me was the individual who was the head of the program. His name was Vannevar Bush. And Vannevar Bush was in charge of the Manhattan Project. He was the president's science advisor, and he is the one who or, or, you know, was in, in charge of this program that really is the mother of all black operations, that is the Manhattan Project. And all other black operations kind of trickle down from that original idea in both analogy and also secrecy. You also point out, for people who wonder whether something could be kept secret, the Manhattan Project, the size and the budget amount, and even the vice president had no idea that the Manhattan Project was underway. I mean, how many people were working? What was the budget of that thing? It's in the book. I know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, it was huge. There was, you know, what, uh, the, where the plutonium or the uranium at the time was being processed um, in Tennessee, that outfit pulled more power off of the United States electrical grid on any given night than the entire city of New York City and yet no one knew it was there. That's how powerful a black operation can be. The vice president that you're referring to when the Manhattan Project was originally going on was Harry Truman. He had no idea about the nuclear weapon until he became president. And the person who told him was Vannevar Bush. Basic question, why name it Area 51? Are there one through 50? If so, explain. Well, that's the subject of a great debate. A lot of people, even a lot of my, my named sources in the book will say, oh, that's just a quadrant that they came up with. Um, but according to my source in the end of the book, the reason that it is named Area 51 is because in 1951, the original equipment and the remains of the Roswell crash came there. Have you been called a conspiracy theorist, this audience member asked. The net of conspiracy theories has been cast so wide it often includes investigative reporters such as yourself. In other words, you kind of get thrown in with the 3 a.m. moons. I, I'll let you guys decide on that one, but what I do know is that a lot, you know, I've been accused of it, I've definitely been accused of being, um, you know, part of the government conspiracy to hide aliens because my theory does not push the idea that aliens have visited Earth. And I did get a letter from a group, uh, or an email rather, from a group in the UK, furious with me last week when my book first published. They said, even we don't believe you. <laughs> <laughs> the truth is still out there, not here. Uh, why did Area 51 show up in the WikiLeaks document, this person wants to know? Was it only due to weapons testing or about alien life or what? That's news to me. I don't know about that, so see me afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> there was a, and a, a lot of the book is about, we're talking about reverse engineering because it, 
comes up in talking about Roswell and things. One of the most significant parts of the book and reverse engineering that went on at Area 51, mm -hmm. one of the greatest secrets was reverse engineering the MiG that was kind of hand delivered for a million dollars by an Iraqi pilot to the Israelis. It's a great story. It's one of my favorites in there, and I tell it through the eyes of T.D. Barnes, who was a, an engineer who worked out at Area 51 on a number of projects. Um, in 1966, you're, the story that you're talking about made headlines when an Iraqi Air Force colonel named Munir Redfa defected from Iraq to Israel in a Soviet MiG. And at the time, no one had, no Western you know, no member of the Western world had ever had their hands on a Soviet MiG. It's what all the Arab uh, nations flew, and it's obviously what the Soviet, the communist bloc countries flew. So the Mossad got a hold of it. It was a very big deal to them. It helped them win the Six-Day War. But what didn't make the news was that after they were done with it, they made a deal with the CIA to bring Munir Redfa's MiG to Area 51. And T.D. Barnes was on the team that reverse engineered that MiG. They took it down to its nuts and bolts and looked at it to figure out what made it fly. And at the time, we were engaged in the Vietnam War, and our pilots over there were getting shot down in this terrible ratio of 9 to 1. We were really losing against the MiG. Um, the Soviets were supplying the North Vietnamese with the MiG. And so there was a halt on the dogfights over Vietnam while the engineers worked on the MiG out there at Area 51. And after they reverse engineered it, that was called the technical phase. Then they began what was called the tactical phase. So they put the MiG back together and they began flying it in dogfights, mock dogfights, in the skies over Area 51 to figure out how to beat the MiG in air-to-air -air combat. And what is not known um, until now, or kind of known only to the, the, the men who worked on that program, is that that was actually the birth of the famous Top Gun fighter school. There's, there's a, another thing that comes of that MiG being there that almost outs Area 51 and some of the top secret projects there when a general decides basically to go joyriding in a MiG. That's right, and it's a pretty controversial story. There was a general who was in charge of the F-117 bomber program out at, that was going on out at Area 51, and he became enamored uh, with the MiG, according to sources, and he wanted to take it for a flight, and he did, and um, the MiG went out of control and crashed in Area 25 next door to, it's about maybe 20 miles from Area 51. And he, where he crashed was right into this place where another secret program was going on. Uh, surprise, surprise. Um, and so at the time, it was like, my god, we've got the MiG program, we've got the F-117 program, we've got the NERVA program at Area 25, we've got Area 51, you know, and you've got a general who's dead. So a uh, newspaper reporter was leaked information that the general had been flying the MiG and that program was outed in that way and it allowed the other secrets to remain hidden. There's a number of questions about the advanced technology created at Area 51 such as Mach 3 speed aircrafts and why this has not been released commercially. Uh, questioner says it's odd that our current commercial aircrafts can only travel at a fraction of the speed compared to what Area 51 technology had half a century ago. Our commercial aircrafts? You know, I'm not an expert on jet engines. I did interview Robert, Atherna Robert Apernathy, who developed the Mach 3 engine for Pratt & Whitney, and it was super interesting talking to him um, about that. But my understanding would be, and it's limited, but that, you know, it takes so much jet fuel to fly uh, Mach 3. The, the Oxcart spy plane was basically a flying fuel tank. It had a delta-shaped wing that was just filled with fuel. Um, it could get from one coast to the other coast in a little over 60 minutes. So I don't think that would be cost effective um, on a commercial airline and you would not really have any place to put your bags. <laughs> Plus all that mid-air refueling. Yes. Mid-air refueling is tricky too. Um, yeah, and, mm -hmm. and a couple of planes were lost yes. in stories yeah. that you tell in the book. 
Oh. Uh, well, I'm going to say one other thing. Sure. You know, the, the, I became a big fan of the CIA's science and technology department, I must say, because the things that they did out there, and they did it in total secrecy without getting any, any credit for it, but to refuel the ox cart, it was such an incredibly fast flying plane. The ox cart had to fly at it at its absolutely slowest speed, and the fuel tanker had to fly at its fastest speed, you know, at the same time. And, uh, you know, the plane, the ox cart would sometimes almost stall. That's how slow it had to go. Um, somebody in the audience says, why do you think the government was prompted to declassify all of this stuff and provide great stuff for your book? Well, that's also an interesting question. They didn't declassify all this stuff. They declassified the A-12 ox cart in 2007, and I don't know why. Um, I've asked some people at Langley why, and they have different, different answers, none of which really answer the question. Um, because if you're trying to keep a base secret, it would make sense not to declassify one of the major programs there. Uh, but that is how I was able to speak to Ed Lovick, who was the original source, and that is how I was introduced one to the next to the next of all the different sources who um, make up the narrative of my book and to whom I'm very grateful because, you know, it was a real honor and a privilege to be able to talk to these men who are really a group of Cold War heroes, um, scientists, spies, engineers, physicists, who were known only among themselves. Uh, and now I think in reading the book you're able to see, a have a really interesting window into what it's like to be someone who does all this work for absolutely no glory. There is a story you tell in the book that people have to read the book to know that is possibly the most frightening, well, there's many frightening parts of the book. Um, and it is a staged attack on Area 51 to test the perimeters for uh, security, even though it was secret to many Americans. The Russians had known about this place since forever and uh, watched it by satellites. And so they decided to test the security, if I understand it from your book correctly, without telling anybody at Area 51, and during the time of a nuclear test. That's right. And the way that I was able to put that story together was very interesting because the actual mock attack on the guard gate at Area 51 by Wackenhut security guards is still classified. But what isn't classified is the fact that these nuclear weapons test engineers on the other side of the fence were working to get a nuclear bomb down into a shaft so that they could explode it on a weapons test. And so the story came from the guys who were over on the other side of the fence who were working on the nuclear bomb, not from the guys at Area 51 who can't talk about it. Um, but what happened was there was this weapons test going on and you, they measure, they measure, the system of measurement to get a bomb down into its hole is pick. So it's like, you know, X number of yards means it's this pick and it has to get to a certain depth before it's considered secured. Otherwise it could still, in essence, be hijacked. And so there's different layers of security that are watching this bomb go down. And the gentleman who is in charge of the program is my um, source in the book, Richard Mingus. He was in charge of it. And there he is waiting for the thing to get down the thing, the nuclear bomb to get down the hole, and he hears suddenly were under attack. And they had to treat that as if the Russians were attacking or an enemy force was attacking because it made no sense otherwise. But as it turned out, it was uh, actually a test by the security people who wanted to see what it would be like, uh, how the guards at the Area 51 gate would respond to an attack. And so they flew a helicopter over the guard gate and were, you know, mock shooting at it. Um, the alert went all the way to the White House, and according to the source, um, the, the nuclear subs on the West Coast were also put on alert. I sleep better hearing that. Um, <laughs> and with a live nuclear weapon in the hole yes. at that time. And the test went on, by the way. number of questions from people saying many of the, here's one of the many of the United States military projects born or developed in Area 51, including the F-117 stealth fighter, uh, was the Black Hawk helicopter used in the Osama bin Laden raid uh, developed at Area 51? 
I would certainly like to know that, but I don't have a need to know about that yet. <laughs> Sounds like it would be a great place to uh, fly those helicopters Several or practice that mock-up. Several questions about whether technology developed there, going, going it's kind of a variation on the previous question about the aircraft, whether the technology there, so, you know, the famous questions about Teflon and mm -hmm. in the space program and all of that, has the famous questions about Teflon and mm -hmm. in the space program and all of that, has gotten out into the commercial world at all or whether what's developed there is just so secret what what's developed at Area 51 stays at Area 51 that's a really interesting question and I don't I haven't heard about any um, commercial applications it tends to be military and espionage based including the stealth paint and mm. and all of that yes the first attempt at which was apparently according to the book mm -hmm. something of a disaster Yes, they tried to originally make the U-2 stealthy um, because when the pilots like Hervey Stockman and immediately were flying over the Soviet Union, the Soviets were able to track them right away. Um, they couldn't shoot them down because they were so high up, but the physicist Ed Lovick was called on board to try and make the U-2 stealthy. It didn't work, and one of the pilots was killed out there flying one of the planes that had been uh, doctored up with some some paint that was supposed to be camouflage and instead it made the plane overheat. Unfortunately we've reached point in our program where there's time for only one last question and uh, somebody kind of open-ended for you. Uh, was there one particular story that you found the most shocking or surprising of the things you learned about Area 51? You know Everything that was told to me was very ornate and very interesting and I think all circled back to allow me to create the puzzle, so to speak. The, all these individual pieces that in and of themselves were fascinating um, to understand the broader, bigger picture of Area 51 was what I found the most rewarding certainly at the end to step back and say this makes sense and this is this this is why it's secret and this is what went on there even though I probably only know a small fraction of it um, Winston Churchill once said about and he was speaking about Russia he said it's an enigma wrapped inside of a puzzle wrapped inside of a riddle and he could have been speaking about Area 51 our thanks to Annie Jacobson, Los Angeles Magazine columnist, author of the new book, Area 51, An Uncensored History of America's Top Secret Military Base.